Well, thank you for coming and to be able to show your, uh, share your experience. I was thinking just for us to kind of introduce ourselves very shortly. Tell us uh, what it is you actually do. Let's start with you. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, at Mehilainen, which is a private healthcare provider in Finland, my job is to make sure that we do the right things and we do those things right. I'm a psychiatrist by background. I also do a little bit of clinical work every week. Ah, interesting. Mm. Okay, so how about you, Pekka? So I am uh, an engineer in background, so I've been working with, with uh, health technologies and, and medical technologies all my career. Currently working at HUS, which is the public hospital system providing secondary and tertiary care services for the residents of southern Finland, about 1.7 million population. I work there as technology officer, so my role is to, to have a helicopter view on technologies and what kind of developments are ongoing, and then about partnerships with uh, both private actors and other stakeholders. Interesting. Thank you so much for coming here. I was thinking about just asking, asking a couple of questions. Uh, let's start out with you, Kaisla. Uh, I was thinking about motivation. You're working with that. How do we motivate people? <laughs> what is it? What is the ingredients? How can we do it? Well, um, I'll refer to the self-determination theory, which was created in the beginning of the t century, the 2000. Um, we talk about three areas that constitute inner motivation in people. And that means that you have to have capability. Whatever you do, you have to feel that it's not too difficult. But then, I, then again, you have to have a little bit, bit of challenge so it's not too easy. It's, right up, it's on the level that you feel capable of doing that thing. The second area is autonomy. It means that you, you choose what you want to do. For example, in digital services, always if you have a little bit of choice, do you want to go take the A or B choice? It helps. You feel that you're an autonomous actor doing, making choices. And the third one is sort of positive social pressure. Mm. It, it's more likely to be, stay motivated if you, for example, told your friend that you're aiming for a marathon next summer. You know, it's, it's, he'll be asking you, you know, how's it going? And it, it'll keep your motivation up. Wow. So three key factors. So you're also dealing with the metric system. Uh, how do we measure effectiveness and how is the digital pathway a part of the whole? Can you explain a little, little bit more about that? Right. So when we talk about digital pathways here, um, narrow it down to digital pathways in healthcare, right? And, and how we can service our patients there. Um, what we focus on this year at Mehilainen is a lot of lifestyle interventions. We help people who want to make changes in, say, in the tobacco cessation. We help them stop smoking, in other words, um, eat better, sleep better, exercise more. And how we measure that? We started with giving people the possibility of setting up their own goals. I think that's most motivating, that they, they set up a goal, and after that, we can do it in metrics. We can measure, have you reached your own goal totally, partly, or not at all, and, and we follow with that. But then, in addition to this, of course, we want, then want to take standardized, internationally validated um, questionnaires, for example, about mental health or exercise amounts and hours and, and so forth. So we combine the self-set goal with these international measures. Interesting. Okay, so how about you, Pekka? What is the most important topic in the university hospitals because of the fact that you come from the pu public sector? Uh, how is it like over there? Well, when, when it comes to developing digital services, so what was striking to me when starting working at the university hospital is the size, the sheer size of the organization and that all the specialties, medical expertise areas are present there and it ranges from a fairly sort of a basic secondary care of supporting the primary care like from, from an ac acute um, uh, accidents and emergency departments all the way to the most demanding like uh, uh, cancer treatments for children or, or organ transplants. And when you think about digital services, you can't start with, a, with an idea that you, you find the best of breed for all these subsectors themselves. You need to build something that scales up. So what we've been talking 
in a development program which is called the Health Village or Terveyskyla is that you need to digitalize one hospital at a time, meaning that solutions need to fit different types of clinical areas. Uh, they need to, uh, of course, be built to meet the clinical needs, but the building blocks have to be, to great extent, identical. Because it is about appointments, it is about symptom diaries, it is about um, measurements and uh, reporting those to the treating physician or nurse. So they are basic blocks in a way. So we have to build scalable systems. If you start building to each specialty what is sort of best of breed for that, you will never be able to um, provide services in a way that a public system needs to do. So all patient groups involved and also different types of users uh, can ha have access to that. So that, that's the main, main idea for us and most important thing, you need to be able to scale it up. And it's technology and then the other part is that the clinicians need to buy it because they have to use it then and change their normal practices so that the clinical digital pathway is part of a total care path and not just an add-on to old working habits. Interesting. Okay, one more question to you, Pekka. And also regarding the population angle, how much does it cover? And also, how do we ensure that the digital services are provided as well as the quality? So, of course, it's a process. So we, we are starting um, or have started about 10 years ago with um, the mental health um, or the psychiatry um, well, so psychotherapy services online, but now it's been expanding since there is a way to scale them up, so there are more than 100 clinical care paths available. Um, the tricky, tricky thing about this is that um, you really need to, need to uh, somehow show the value in measurable terms. And in a public organization, it can't be that you do more services for more turnover, because we're talking in a budget-constrained world. So you'd need to treat more patients with the same kind of resources, meaning that, for example, patients that previously couldn't get any care, they could get a digital therapy or a, uh, or a self-service therapy. Is it in, in uh, mental health or things like um, chronic headache. Then another angle is, is that you hospitals need to uh, move part of the treatment from the hospital, inside the hospital walls, out to patients' home. Take chronic diseases like, like um, dialysis treatments for kidney failure patients. So uh, there is a way to do home dialysis with equipment, and if it's supported properly with the digital tools, so patients can uh, do, uh, to a great extent, dialysis treatments by themselves at home, just having the clinical, uh, digital tools supporting them at a distance, which is triple win. The patient is uh, getting easier, does not have to go to the clinic. The <coughs> providers can save, save uh, time, treat more patients, and the payers can get budget, budget benefits because it is cost-efficient to treat patients at home. Interesting. Okay, so, well, now we have some more insights, uh, how you work and what you work with. Uh, let's just kind of turn the volume up a little bit because, I mean, uh, Kaisla, you belong to the private sector and Pekka, you belong to the, uh, the public sector, right? So if you, we would ask one question, which one is the best? Cooperation is best. Ah, ah, cooperation. That's a very diplomatic answer. No, but seriously, I'm, uh, I'm just kidding. But like, if we would talk about similarities and maybe some differences, I mean, uh, Kaisla, you've been working with both the public sector as well as the private. What would you say is the, the similarities or the differences? Mm. Well, similarities are easy to establish. We, we know that both want to provide the best, best health care. And, and I think 
both the public sector has been criticized for not thinking that the patient also is a customer and also deserves good service. But I think that paradigm is changing. And what is, was just described here, I think more and more we have tools both for, both for the private sector and public sector um, people that they're able to choose, for example, make their own appointments online. And, and, and that's, the, that's a service way of thinking, which I think is, is, is great that it's available for everyone. Um, more about differences, maybe sometimes the private sector has more agility, more possibilities to do pilots, try small things, and then and what works we put forward, what doesn't we can forget about it. That might be a bit slower still than the public sector. On the other hand, the public sector has great credibility that we know that if, they, if something works there with the just the described very large variety of patients, then we know it, it can work anywhere. You have to take care of the most difficult university level top care. If I jump in here, so I think that continue the, the private companies, they have the maybe more freedom and also more ability to focus on things. Public sector tends to, you know, do a little bit of everything everywhere. And uh, private providers, they have the managerial capacity and also um, they can choose what kind of business model they run and can choose what kind of uh, customer segments and services are provided. They have more liberty in that than the public sector, which makes it efficient. You, you, you focus and you execute, and that's where private sector is performing better, I think, than the public sector. Then on the other hand, um, when it comes to the very demanding um, clinical care, which involves both you know, in hospital and out, out, uh, outpatient services, the public sector still seems to hold a majority of the clinical expertise because there's also the research and education, which is uh, like integral part of a, of, of a university hospital, which means that um, the, the uh, state-of-the-art demanding care uh, is developed at the same time as the new, as the new services and, and the public organizations maybe have an, an edge, on, edge on that. That's my sort of gut feeling at the moment. Mm. And I think that's also something that might be changing. We know there's more and more research and, and training rights that the private sector also has. So we'll see how that is in the future. And there are we do cooperation as well. There are some research projects that where we have that we do together with the public and private sector. So we'll we'll see how that paradigm might change. It's also what you talked about um, agility. So we are a big public procurer. So the, one of the biggest in in Finland, and that is um, um, cumbersome uh, work to do public procurement. But then on the other hand, it's a tool for us also to use the market because there are, there are then innovative companies that at best could then offer the solutions to who's... The problem often there is that, that private companies like technology companies, they, if they focus on a too narrow uh, uh, a thing, it might be that it doesn't fit into the, the general um, big picture of, of a hospital because you can't be best on all the tiny little things. You have to have an acceptable, good level uh, general services that are, that are um, uh, or general solutions that are provided by, by a hospital of our size. Mm. One difference that came to mind is, well, we have the sort of reform going on. You don't want to hear Again. that. <laughs> but um, uh, what the public sector doesn't have yet, because we're lacking that reform, like, like you were describing, the, the, the specialized healthcare, like who's has, they do things that could, could be something that public, that the basic healthcare centers could be doing. So it's very, it's a large range that you do, and it's tough to sort of measure the, the value of all of that. But now in some municipalities, we have these outsourced uh, chains, healthcare chains, we, we work in, Merilappi, well, where we work with both the basic healthcare sector and the specialized healthcare. And there, for example, take any, take diabetes. It's, it's very motivating to measure the effectiveness 
of the whole chain. We know we take care of them from the very beginning till the very end at the complicated cases. So I think the public sector would benefit more from that to be able to sort of measure, use the same tools and measure that whole value chain. I think that uh, why the primary care digital services are maybe lagging behind in the public sector is partially because of that. The, the SOTA reform is needed not for the hospital's sake, but for the primary care, because it's too fragmented, too small units. Even bigger cities' primary care uh, um, are not perhaps able to build their own good digital services, because it's something that, that you, need, you need scale. You need to be a big operator in, in order to, to benefit from digital services, or, and you need competencies to build them be it in-house competencies or competencies you buy from the market. But if you are a tiny, small health, health primary care provider in a, in a municipality, you don't have the scale and you don't have the, maybe the, the capabilities of doing that. So that's why uh, a reform for the public health is needed. It's not the hospitals. Hospitals are, are, at least the university hospitals, they are fairly big in size and can have already demonstrated that they can build digital services uh, and take them into use quite efficiently. Well, uh, interesting. And you're also working towards the same goal, of course, but maybe in different ways, and in some ways you're quite similar. So I was thinking about the future. What kind of type of challenges do you see regarding the public and the private? Well, on the, on the public, um, we have... Um, of course, the, the opportunities, if we stick to, to technology, so the opportunities of technology, both in, in medicine and in IT, they are just growing all the time. And the uh, public sector needs to be very careful what kinds of treatments and what kinds of technologies are taken into use so that the uh, costs that do not... Uh, grow uncontrolled, and I think this is a big challenge. Then we share the same challenges as, as every other uh, organization. S sustainability, how do we, do we consume less natural resources and do, do more with, with less available, uh, and uh, um, all kinds of responsibility issues are, are strongly rising also in, on our agenda, the recently published um, a strategy from who uh, brings for the first time really in the core core strategic goals is how do we uh, work in a sustainable manner also taking care of environmental uh, and social and economic sustainability in all, all, all of its angles. I think this is a and then there is the workforce issue where unfortunately the tension between private and public sector is sometimes demonstrated the most because there is lack of workforce and we are battling over the same same people and that's uh, not a very very um, easy thing to to solve mm. yeah i was also about to raise the yeah. wor workforce issue and i think there's a lot of responsibility there's a lot we could do together that there's a lot of writing in the media about different crises, a crisis here and crisis there, and I'm thinking about young people. I have teenagers at home thinking, you know, what do they want to do when they grow up? And I'm thinking, you know, how, how does the media look? Right now, robots are sexy, and, and the, you know, working in the media is sexy, but it doesn't look like healthcare or, or, or social care in particular that isn't very tempting because of these. So, so I think that there's a lot we could do and tell about the, the base, not always the hype, but the basic good work and the, the meaning people feel at work and that that's something we could do to help. But definitely the workforce issue is, is huge. Another challenge for the private sector, partly maybe also for the public sector, is the, the good positive pressure to publish uh, quality metrics effectiveness metrics, and, and we're, we're so lagging behind Nordic countries, the states, um, and I think peop everyone is afraid to be the first, and since, and THL, THL is doing good work with trying to set, you know, national guidelines, or what, what should be, what is the data that we should be sharing, so it's exactly comparable, but that takes time, and people are impatient, and I think we could take, you know, first steps, even if it's not directly comparable, publish something, start with something, and then, you know, 
go from there. I think that's something everyone is sort of looking at each other, thinking, should we do go there? Should we not go there? Who's doing what? It's, it's a playground. I really uh, agree with you on that. Um, then from our, our angle, uh, who's being the only sort of international level healthcare actor in Finland. So for us in many specialties and as a whole, often the comparison or benchmarking is not uh, another organization in Finland, but it has to be compared to, to what is happening in Stockholm or what is happening in Copenhagen or other European hospitals. Who's is, it was a surprise to me, I'm, I'm fairly new about a year in, in who's, it's, it's one of the biggest hospital systems in Europe. Mm -hmm. So even though it's, we're well, not a big country, so the southern Finnish population and how the public secondary care is, is organized, it makes us very big. We have a big population base, all of the uh, medical, med areas of medicine and, and care are, are provided, and we are not a, like a focused tertiary hospital. We also have the basic level secondary care, which is uh, delivered from, especially in, in Porvo, Hyvinkä and, and Lohja hospitals. So it's, uh, we are fairly big, so it means that we have to have comparable um, um, organizations from elsewhere, and often they are outside Finland. Interesting. Okay, so I was thinking about the future. What do you think your services will look like, let's say, from 10 years from now, private and public? Where do you think you will be in 10 years? 10 years is a long time, but... Um, Let's make it five. <laughs> okay. well, five and 10. Let's make it five. Um, I believe there will be more and more partnerships, public-private partnerships. In 10 years, I hope, um, the private sector will see as a reliable partner also for training new physicians, training new nurses, training new professionals for child welfare. Um, and maybe we'll see more and more, I hope, that the tertiary services, the university hospitals will be able to focus on, on the most difficult cases and, and, and maybe some, and the outsourcing will go towards the secondary specialized care or, and because that makes it efficient and it costs less all in all on a national level that way. Uh, research, I hope Finland and maybe the Nordics together will be able to sh share Research projects were extremely small. When you think about narrow patient groups, we won't find enough patients in all of Finland. We should do work together more with the Nordics and use the digital tools we have for that, for patient recruitment, for studies, all of that. How about you, Pekka? What do you think? Um, thinking about 10 years forward is always, you start to think that there will be something big changes. But then if you think 10 years backwards, so how's life different 10 years ago? So you think still, you know, world changes quite slowly. Uh, public sector changes even more slowly. But still I think that, that um, it's about activities that we are doing together. And there I agree with, with Kaisla that, that this is something that I, I feel we're going to see a shift, that there are more collaborative uh, efforts done um, in the future and in 10 years time also the, the different types of collaborative models and um, things that we are um, delivering not only for Finnish patients but maybe uh, uh, solutions in, in the global markets or solutions for patients elsewhere, it might have taken off significantly. Now we see that as a, as a potential but a little bit like a, uh, uncertain, uncertain area. I think this is this is an in interesting development, uh, but it comes around partnerships. I agree on that. Uh, joint, collaborative working, and um, trust, which we have to then maintain. And when everything then revolves a lot about digital and data, so trust becomes maybe the. the the topic number one, so, so physical trust and then also different kinds of governance and uh, auditing systems that they, they enforce trust and people are uh, aware of what is happening so that um, scandals uh, do not overtake, you know, the, the positive um, visions that, that we as 
digital health believers think that that is, is coming our way. Mm. One trend I also think will be growing is the self-auditing you mentioned, that we, we have these um, quality certifications and so forth, we work with those, but it's, it comes from the outside and I think a positive thing these scandals have brought on all our healthcare and social care organizations is that we, we want to show them, we want to do it ourselves, we do self-auditing and, and it's much more motivating because then you have set the KPIs yourselves and you choose do you, whether you measure the things weekly or monthly or, or whatever works for you. And I think that's something we could also, it, it could also be a, produce more value and a way to sell Finland abroad as well, to show that we care, we have high quality value, high quality services, we trust each other, and, and digital tools obviously help there, that we don't have to do, maintain handheld questionnaires, but with digital tools, a lot of the quality metrics could be I measured. I think the time is running up. I think we could all agree we could sit here for hours because it's very interesting and of course uh, you could continue discussing it. But it's very nice to see that you have some similarities and also some differences but you're always working towards the same goal. So this was the fireside chat and we would like to thank uh, Kaisla and Pekka for giving their insights and their expertise. A big, a big warm of applause for them.